The war in Ukraine is still going on. Most of us here in America, especially those who have a personal connection to Ukraine, try to help with whatever we can. But some decide to go to the border. I recently spoke with such a volunteer. Megan Kwozniak just returned from the Polish-Ukrainian border. Take a listen. I, I think, I believe one of the biggest reasons that I became very affected by the situation is that um, I'm Polish and everything that's been happening is happening close to where I was born and raised. Um, and uh, I was just feeling uh, awful about all the news coming out of Ukraine, the suffering of the people. And I was reading a lot about how the Polish people were helping a lot, including my own family. My own family in Poland had taken in uh, Ukrainian refugees and they stayed with them for uh, some time, trying to get them um, like in a transition mode to for them to get to other places. What so, do you do? I'm an ER physician. I work here in Florida um, and I had found out through one of my friends, another physician, fellow physician, who has his own humanitarian organization. Uh, that he was at the border. So I messaged him immediately and asked him if he could get me in and what the options were for getting involved. He got back to me and, uh, and that's how it all started. Uh, other organization who had set up the tent for medical uh, professionals to come and help is called SSF. That's who you were with? I was with them, yes. Uh, describe the logistics in terms of visa, COVID requirements, and uh, travel, tickets, uh, accommodations. How was it? Okay. The, there's no visa need necessary for American citizens to travel to Poland, um, so you can just travel. In terms of COVID, I believe the... Um, I'm trying to remember. It wasn't a test. I believe you had to be vaccinated. Well, if you were vaccinated, you did not need to have a test. There was an online link you could fill out and you put in your dates of vaccination and that's all they checked. So that was not an issue. Accommodations can be a bit of a challenge right now. There's a lot of volunteers near the border in town of Przemysl. Uh, that seems to be the town where most people are staying. It's uh, just a, about a 30 minute drive from the border. Uh, I had actually uh, stayed with my family in Poland who live about 45 minutes away. So they, I called them and they immediately said, yes, of course, come, you can stay with us. I had rented a car and I would drive to the border from their house every day to uh, help out. Describe the first days when you got there. First of all, it was uh, very cold. <laughs> the weather was very cold. So yeah. What was the temperature? It was probably like in the 30s Fahrenheit, if I translated. So, uh, it was very chilly, so you made sure you had to have a lot of layers. Um, the border currently has um, a lot of volunteer tents set up from different organizations from all over the world. So it's quite busy. The tent that I was stationed at, the medical tent of uh, the organization SSF, was actually the first tent right by the, by the entry point. So we were able to see a lot of refugees just literally crossing into Poland from Ukraine. Um, the overall, you know, there's a lot of, uh, it's just a little bit chaotic or was a little bit chaotic there, uh, but in a good sense, meaning there was a lot of different volunteers, tents, people offering food, people offering uh, drinks, both to volunteers and people crossing. Um, there was a vet tent, so a lot of different stuff. Uh, where are the volunteers mainly from? What countries? A lot of European volunteers. Um, people from England, uh, Germany, um, people of other nationalities who live in Europe. For example, there was a, a big uh, Sikh community that came from, I can't remember which country, I believe it might have been England. I'm not exactly sure, I don't want to okay. write false, but they, they lived in Europe, but they had a big tent helping out as well. Uh, what specific skills do volunteers need to possess or uh, it's preferred to have in terms of profession, like you're a doctor, uh, language skills, etc.? I would say language skills are absolutely uh, the most um, important thing. Like Polish have. or Ukrainian, U uh, Russian? Ukrainian and Russian. Mm -hmm. um, I will say that most people coming through uh, 
most Ukrainian people coming through did not speak very good English. Not all, of course, there were some that were that did, but most did not. And it was of absolute help if somebody was able to communicate with them in Russian. A lot of them speak Russian as well as Ukrainian. So if you're thinking about going, if anybody's thinking about going to volunteer and speaks Russian and Ukrainian, you're absolutely would be needed the most. What uh, specific challenges do women face there? The, the uh refugees so there was a lot of um, really heartbreaking stories that we were hearing from people for the most part most of the refugees coming through were women and children as 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 we know um, the men uh, in ukraine currently are being basically required to stay and and a lot of times fight correct Mm -hmm. so it was mostly women that were crossing um, any any specific women-centric story that stuck in your mind that you can share with us? Sure. I mean, there were a couple of um, heartbreaking stories. You know, there were stories of rape. Um, we had one woman that was pretty much held uh, hostage by the Russian army and was raped. Um, in what town? In Chernobyl. Yeah. So that that do people live in Chernobyl? No, but there was a, a big hostage situation there for the for the workers. There are some people that live there, but this was mostly people that work at the plant. Um, How old is she? I don't know the exact age, uh, but I mean youngish. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Um, there was also stories, interestingly enough, of some women who wanted to flee, and their husbands did not want to let them go. So we had a woman who was battered by her husband because she wanted to take her Ukrainian son. Ukrainian husband. Yes. Because she wanted to go and take her son. She had a young son, six or seven years old, I don't remember. She wanted to go because she was worried for their safety. And unfortunately, the husband got very upset. She was able to leave, um, but as we can imagine, this is extremely traumatizing considering you're already living through war and now you have to deal with that. So, yeah. Um. There are some reports circulating on social media that some volunteers are not necessarily contributing. They are occupying precious real estate parking lots and the food which is intended for refugees. Did you, can you confirm these reports? Um, I will, I'm not sure if I can confirm. I will say this. There was a large number of volunteers there. I wasn't always sure what everyone's role was. Um, I could potentially see that as as being the case, uh, where, you know, there's almost too much overcrowding. overcrowding um, and people may not possess the right skills, right? Sure. They go there just maybe curious I don't I don't know it's interesting because you know I do feel that for example some some volunteers were mainly involved in greeting the people who have crossed the border making sure they get a warm snack something to eat pointing them in the right direction I do see that as potentially useful as well Um, there was a lot of volunteers who were crossing the border into Ukraine and they were bringing the people waiting in line um, for example, how to drink, you know, again, very cold, sometimes rainy. Um, and people on the Ukrainian side were sometimes waiting over two days just to cross. So outside, outside absolutely. No, no formal, you know, building set up with heat or anything like that. You were literally just outside. And there were some volunteers that were going over and bringing hot drinks, extra blankets, umbrellas when it was raining. So I I do see a lot of value in that. Um, Could I see that in some instances there were people? Absolutely. I do feel like in every situation there's the good and the bad. I do feel like a lot of times what I did see was um, overabundance of um, donations. There was a lot of clothes just kind of sitting there. It was a lot of garbage. You know, I'm not sure how how helpful that was. Um, I definitely saw that, but you know, I see where everybody tries to help, so. As a doctor, a medical doctor, what kind of injuries, traumas did you mainly deal? 
We did. We were not treating any war-related injuries. Just to be clear, this was not a tent set up for any kind of uh, Surgery. surgeries or anything like that. This was mostly first aid uh, needs. Uh, so um, people that say they were waiting to cross for a long time, they developed, um, you know, pain anywhere, abdominal pain, headaches, vomiting, uh, stomach upset, things like that. We were uh, their first point of contact. In certain situations, if we felt that the case was more severe and required transport to the hospital, we were able to call ambulance very easily from the Polish, from Przemysl, um, the hospital there, and they were very prompt in responding, and they would come and, and take the patient to the hospital. There was a few instances where we needed to do that, um, but a lot of times people just wanted someone to talk to. They wanted something for pain or anxiety, you know, a lot of anxiety coming through, obviously a lot of sadness. So they were just grateful to have someone to talk to. So I would assume psychologists are in high demand. They I might. would think that absolutely. I, I would think that, you know, the, from what I understand right now, there is no such service offered or just not available. Um, I think that would be of absolute importance to have something like that set up. Uh, what do you think, how uh, regular ordinary Americans can help? Is it better to donate like a lot of us do or really go and volunteer? I would say that um, number one, well, if you are Russian or Ukrainian speaking, it's probably, and you're very adamant about going, I would say it's definitely worth it. So you could communicate with the people crossing through um, and help translate for whoever needs that. Um, we were very lucky because my friend speaks Russian. She was with us and she was extremely helpful. I would say more than us. Uh, she, she's, not a, she's not medical, but she was extremely useful. Um, she was able to talk to the people, find out what they need, uh, relate the information to us. Mm -hmm. um, I would say otherwise, don't just go on your own because we could run into that situation that we had mentioned earlier. I would say pairing up with an organization is definitely better. Um, and uh, I think donations are always a great help. How heavy is emotional toll on you? Uh, I know that you're probably more prepared than other ordinary people because you're a doctor from ER, uh, but uh, frequently people who go to hot spots have PTSD. Mm -hmm. um, what's your take on this? Is it uh, really what, you know, people, it's probably too early, you just came back, but what do you think? So. You know, like you mentioned, I, I do work in very difficult situations sometimes, so I do consider myself somewhat resilient, which doesn't mean I'm not, you know, insensitive. I mean, the stories you hear, it's, it's very heartbreaking. For me, the biggest problem was actually when I wasn't there helping. The, the stories that I was reading about and what I was hearing was really breaking my heart and really affecting me which is why which is what prompted me to take action so for me action is really important you know i didn't want to just sit there and read about it and and feel like helpless and hopeless i wanted to i said okay what is it that i can do in this situation and that was what i could do i could go and and you know utilize my skills as a physician to go and try to help so when i was there obviously i was very sad um, I actually have my own blog too. I was I was writing about it the other day. I'm going to post it um, very soon, probably today. But I'll I was put a link. yes, please. But I was actually writing about it, and there were moments that I was very much effective. And you know, we cried. There were moments when we did cry, and uh, we felt uh, that maybe you know, were we really helping someone because they've been through so much, and what can we do? Um, but overall, uh, just going there and doing something really helped me put things into perspective. Okay. I also feel like, you know, I wanted the focus to be on the people, not so much me. Like, of course, you know, there's moments of sadness and difficulty, but they are the ones that are truly suffering. And I cannot imagine the stuff that they went through. You know, I cannot imagine having to leave your home, not, not, not having a home to go back to, not knowing what's going to happen. So. I was going to ask you how easy it was for you to just take off. You, you have family here. You, you're married, right? Was your husband okay with you traveling? 
to this dangerous place you know he, he's a very supportive man thankfully and he actually uh, he organized he was extremely helpful not not in the not only in the fact that he supported me going but also he organized um, all the medications and supplies okay. uh, that I was taking back with me and also sent a couple more shipments to my friend from that organization who was at the border so he actually did a tremendous uh, behind the scenes work so to speak where uh, he was able to organize all the meds and stuff like that. May 9th is a very important day for um, Russians, Ukrainians. I don't know if you know about it, but it's uh, it's the end of the World War II for mm -hmm. former Soviet Union. So after being there, spending some time, do you feel like uh, there is light at the end of the tunnel? Is it like they're close to some kind of resolution? To be very honest, I, I don't know if I'm qualified to answer that question. Um, what your sense? I don't think it's going to end that easily. Um, and not by May 9th, right? That's... I don't think so. I would love to see yeah. that. Question is, can you, you know, what comes out, what they say they're going to do, is it really going to happen? We don't know. But there's been so much loss of life and so much tragedy and pain that I, I do believe most people want it to be over. Most people want it to end. Whether that's going to happen or not, I don't know. Thank you so much. I appreciate it. From Florida, I'm Jane Greaves.